Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to day two of PMA number nine presentations. Uh, I'm still pumped on a high from what everybody did yesterday. Um, I hope you get a sense of why this is such a big deal. Not the, not the reports per se, but the kind of work that you all did and do for a living. I mean, it really is the safety net of our society and you are the un, unsung heroes uh, that go out there day in, day out and try to do the best you can to serve the communities in your areas. And um, so we're, I just wanna say that our team, we're super pumped and thrilled to be part of this journey. You know, we're, we feel like we wanna be your biggest cheerleaders and that we can, whatever we can do to help you uh, continue to do this amazing work um, to make a difference in the world. And so um, I hope that, uh, you know, I wish you luck as you move forward, not only through today for our presenters for today and everything beyond PMA, um, as far as OCPM is concerned, but just being part of our family and part of our group, whatever we can do to help support you moving forward. Um, a couple of reminders before we get the party started today. Uh, again, this is being recorded. Uh, so we, we actually will record all three days and they will be up on display um, down the road. Um, it takes a little while for them to get edited and, and, and put back up online, but you will have uh, PMA number nine uh, in the support, you know, and the programs will be actually posted on through YouTube and our, our website. So you'll have the executive summaries and then we'll also have the videos for each presentation. So we're, we're trying to create like a, a catalog and a just a deep bench of project summaries to pull from for future use, best practices, and trying to just share all the work that you have all been putting into this over the years. And uh, I'm just, again, just thrilled to be a part of this. Uh, a couple of reminders for today. Please continue to uh, fill out the individual project evaluation forms. Those are required um for the actual cohort members we we want to have a hundred percent participation um with you know those um evaluations for each each presenter each team or each individual so they can take a look and see if they can incorporate some of that content back into their work so uh please you know if you could do us a favor please fill out the evaluations. Alexandra drops that chat, or she drops the link in the chat. So it's pretty easy and convenient. Uh, if for some reason you missed it, just let us know. And uh, you know, we'll make sure that we get it over to you as soon as possible. The second thing, I made an announcement yesterday in case you weren't there, didn't hear it. At the time, the project presentations are gonna, I'm sorry, the written reports, she's having a rough morning. The, the written reports are gonna be due at the end of January. We typically have the reports due uh, one month after the last the last oral presentation, which, which would be January 15th, but because of the holidays and all the hustle and bustle and all the other things going on, I wanted to extend it out a few more weeks just to give yourself some more time to kind of put the finishing touches on it. Uh, again, if you have any questions, concerns, issues, you need something else, you need more time, we're having an issue, just let us, just please be in touch, you know, communicate with us and we can make arrangements for that. I don't want this to be a burden. I don't want this to be overwhelming um, as far as the written report is concerned, but I do, and I do want to give you plenty of time so that you can address, uh, you know, any kind of issues that way. So just keep us posted. I, I failed to say last yesterday that we in the within Blackboard, there is a project management folder and you should see all the different the, the template, the rubric, um, several examples of written reports and things like that. So we, we try to create as many resources for you as possible. Um, but if you want, if you can't find it or need more information, feel free to reach out to myself, Alexandra, or Kat. I'd be happy to provide that to you. Our, also, our last announcement before we get the party started is our last presentation is going to be on Thursday, December 15th, and that will be a packed agenda. So we will have a full morning for that. 
today's sessions, we only have three, which is fantastic because we'll be able to finish up by around 11 o'clock so you can get an early start to your weekend. But we have three presentations today. Uh, first one is with Mallory and Robinette, and then we have Carl Kirtland, and then we have Jeff Grubb rounding us out. So I'd um, like to just call up to uh, get this party started. I'd like to see if, if um, Mallory and Robinette could get promoted up to the to the presenter stand here and um, get their information pulled up. Good morning. Oh, I'm Mallory and Robinette. How are you? Good. Good. Good morning. Well, you all look good on my side. I don't see your PowerPoint yet, so if you want to just oral your presentation, so you want to pull that up and then rock and roll. Um, you can take it away at your leisure. All righty, it looks good to me. All right. And you're making me hungry. I just want to say that like, I forgot to have breakfast. I just got up and got, and I forgot to eat. So anything you got there, just, Send it in the chat and I'll be more than happy to take it. Oh, yeah, out. sure. <laughs> All, All right. right. Cool. Ready? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mallory, obviously, and with me today is Robinette Simpkins. And we are here to talk to you guys about meal participation and school nutrition. So a little bit about Cleveland Metropolitan School District and the school nutrition program. So we have close to 90 school buildings and over 22,000 meals are served daily. We offer five different components every day. So we offer fruits, vegetables, dairy, protein, and grain. Our vision is to nourish and educate our scholars and staff. And our mission is to ensure that each scholar receives prompt, professional, and courteous service, a nutritious meal or snack, and practical nutrition education. So the problem that we've been seeing in our department since the pandemic is low participation. And this is due to various reasons. Um, one of them being a lot of the time kids aren't coming to school after the pandemic. So attendance, tardiness, that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes it could be unappealing food. Maybe the menu items are just not things that the kids have a taste for or like. And then we also are experiencing a lot of staffing issues. So there's a lot of things that do contribute to the problem, um, which we're gonna kind of go into further um, as far as how we're going to resolve those issues. The expected purpose and goal of our project is to understand what drives meal participation and slowly increase our participation throughout the district. <clears throat> Mallory and I, we had the pleasure of going to three different local school districts to compare and compile information on what drives, um, what, how can we increase our meal participation? Um, if you will see our chart here, we ask questions such as, is your school district experiencing staff shortages? Everyone was. Uh, and everybody is still trying to get their staff back together due to the pandemic. And everyone is using the same USDA commodities and products. So, that was all the same across the board. And we are in Cleveland Metropolitan School District, a CP district, it's a community eligibility provision. Uh, we noticed that Menor Schools in North Royalton was not, but Cincinnati and, and Cleveland is. And everybody is not um, experiencing discipline issues such as us. So what we saw, we will show you some pictures in the next couple of slides of what we saw as far as teamwork. And we, we kind of took that information to bring it towards our district. Um, what is one of the students' favorite menu items? Pizza, of course, and we noticed nachos. So across the board, everybody loves the nachos. And we noticed also that everybody is working about the same hours a day. So that was good. Um, we also want to use the high schools enrollments. We use one of our highest schools enrollment to look at their ADP 
we noticed that between 33% and 40% of the students are eating. And Cincinnati and Cleveland schools have an executive shelf where North Royalton and Metro schools does not. So that kind of gave us a little leverage also. And Cincinnati and Cleveland schools also has a soft seasoning station, which the children love. They're able to season their foods um, per their choice. Um, we also asked, do you have taste testing surveys for new menu items? Most of the schools, they do offer some sort of um, incentive for that. We offer both in Cleveland schools, whereas Mentor, they talk to the students, they observe their place, if they're eating the food or not. And North Royalton schools, they do offer free samples for new items and Cincinnati schools offers the same as us. Um, how do you get the students to eat? We offer different um, incentives, which you will learn about in our um, project as we go on. Um, Mentor does not, um, North Royalton does, and Cincinnati, they do not. So this was the big question also, do you notice that kids are eating more or less since the pandemic? Everybody said less. So how can we increase meal participation? Okay, so we're gonna talk about North Royalton School uh, and their meal program. So what we noticed when we visit them, first of all, awesome kitchen. Um, if you look at their menu, it was very colorful on their serving line. They wrote out um, what the menu was. It was very eye-catching. They also had a pizza oven. Um, their screens were colorful and eye-catching. It allowed the students um, to go into the different designated line if they wanted pizza or if they wanted Asian foods for the day. It was just a line set up for those. So depending on what you wanted to eat, there was a line for it. Um, all their fresh options looked at so appetizing. Mallory and I, we had pleasure of eating lunch there. It was just so hard to pick what we wanted to eat because everything looked so good. Um, they, as I explained two slides ago, they had um, four hot option stations. And if you look at the food that is being served, they are the same commodities that we use here in CMSD. They just stepped it up a notch. Um, if you look at the pizza on the far um, right side, bottom, um, we saw um, workers um, sauteing mushrooms and different things and making pizza where they just wasn't serving pepperoni and a slice of cheese pizza. They may put sausages on there. They kind of went up a step notch, you know, brought it up some and they put more items on it and it was really good. So this is what the students are eating. I took some pictures of their plates and what we noticed was that a lot of the students had fresh options on their plates. You didn't have to tell them what to get. They chose their own meals and everything looked so good on their plates. They also utilize smart snack tests, we do also, and their displays look just like a store. If you were to walk in the store, everything just looked very nice. It was set up nice. And the kids, they, they went and bought their options. It was just very, just well put together. And what was big for Mallory and I is the, amount of teamwork that we saw. Nobody complained. We saw everybody working together. If someone was done with their duties, they just chipped in and helped someone else. And that was very big for us. And we also went to mentor schools, city schools. Um, mentor city schools, just the fresh options was just very, very awesome also. They have a beautiful self-made garden. We were able to go see their garden, check it out. Uh, it was very nice. They also let the kids um, come and pick some of the vegetables that, that's ready to be picked. And they serve it on the line. So the kids is able to eat what, they're pick, what they picked off the garden. And that was very, very big and nice. If you see the sign, we noticed that the signage, we were told that the kids 
they make the signage. They did all the signages that they use in the schools. And it was very nice and well put together and it's in, in their cafeterias. Also, we noticed that they had a salad bar um, and a lot of their things from the salad bars from their school's garden. What are the kids are eating? We noticed a smoothie, they had made a smoothie. The kids were able to pick from a smoothie. They had fresh grapes, they had pretzels. It, it was just, it was like, wow, it was very good. So we also had the pleasure of visiting Cincinnati Public Schools, which is a similar district to Cleveland. They have about the same amount of kids as us, just a little less school buildings. So this one kind of shows a more similar CEP school to what, we're, um, what we are in Cleveland. So this was a photo of the fresh salads that they had on um, their serving line, which I mean, to look at that and see it, and I just think that's something that the kids would gravitate towards because they see this fresh option available. So those are the fresh salads. They had um, a nice display of their burgers and chicken patties and the display cooler down there, you can see is stocked fully. looks like it's something that you would see at, you know, Giant Eagle or Dave's. And then those in that corner there are um, the fresh options that they offer on a fruit and veggie bar every day. So you, they kind of have different things like cantaloupe, cauliflower, chickpeas, things that you may not normally think kids would want to eat, but because it's there in front of them and it looks so good, they, they are gravitated towards it. They also do a lot with signage, making things look um, nice. And as you can see, they have a little funny super orange on there. So just kind of making the cafeteria and kitchen an appealing place for the kids to be. So next we're gonna dive into what our school district does. Um, so after visiting these schools, we kind of had to take a look at what we were doing and see what's working and what's not working and how can we make a change to increase this participation, um, taking ideas from the other districts that we visited. So as we all know, a hungry child cannot learn. And that is the whole point of this project because we wanna make sure that the kids are eating breakfast and lunch so that they can get through their school day. So in Cleveland, we do a lot of different things. Um, the top left picture, we had some apples out for apple crunch day. The next picture is, those are our grab and go carts that we have in the morning. So that was a fully stocked cart. And then you'll just see some pictures of our line and some pictures of our display coolers, as you can see below. There's a lot of similarities between the display coolers and the serving lines um, as far as how we stock them and things like that. So what we're currently doing, what, these are ideas that we've already started, things that we've already implemented um, before and during this project. So we started offering taste testings and surveys. So what we would do is if we found a menu item that was gonna be something new that we wanted to expose the kids to, instead of just throwing it on the menu, we'd go to the school, do a taste test, and then just see what they liked about it and what they didn't like, because we don't wanna waste our time menuing an item that kids aren't going to eat. We recently did a golden ticket competition. We went to Daniel Morgan, which is a K through eight school in the district. And we stuck little golden tickets under random trays. And when the kids came through the line, they were able to look under their tray and see if they won a prize. Another big thing that we did was smoothies. So we'll sometimes go into a classroom and do a smoothie demo, or we'll just do the smoothie demo in the cafeteria and have those smoothies out for the kids to take on the line. And the smoothie is part of a reimbursable meal. We also try to do treats around the holidays. They make certain um, smart snack treats that we can actually add onto our menu like cupcakes and cookies. And that kind of encourages and gets the kids excited to eat. We recently also received a USDA grant for um, the fruit and veggie bars in the selected school. previous slides, there are photos of those bars with the fresh fruits and vegetables on them. So that's something that we kind of took from um, them sauce and seasoning stations in all the high schools. And um, we also do parent inform informational brochures and community meetings about our product. A few years back, we had a time where we actually invited parents out to the school and we, let, we set up the serving line just like we would for the kids and we let them walk through and taste test our items, which was really beneficial. Unfortunately, we stopped that with the pandemic because people weren't really coming out. So that's something we're gonna bring back. And then we also, this year, um, 
we started principal meetings to support our program initiatives. So at the start of every school year, we talked to the principals, explained to them our rules and regulations, why the kids need to eat, and um, make sure that they're informed of our regulations so that it kind of gets us to an easier start. So as you can see in the top left corner, that's our executive chef. He was doing a smoothie demonstration at John F. Kennedy, which is a high school. Below that is um, a way that we use a survey to taste test pizza. So you can see that looks like pepperoni was the favorite topping. Um, next to chef, you'll see our golden ticket. So we put those at the bottom of those trays at Daniel Morgan. Below that are our little sweet um, smart snack cookies that we'll use as prizes or treats for the holidays. To the right of that, you'll see myself and the executive chef. That was us doing our demonstration at JFK. And then that little top picture with the little decorated apples, that was our apple crunch day. We were trying to get kids to eat local apples that day. So we, our staff kind of decorated them up like little ninjas for them to eat. And then um, that lower picture to the bottom right is a seasoning and sauce station at Max Hayes. So they have different sauces they can choose from to add to whatever menu item it was that day. So what are we doing to build morale and good customer service with our kitchen employees? We have implemented team building exercises to reduce the employee issues and discipline that we have in our district. And it's just to build trust and teamwork within the cafeterias and the school kitchens. We're offering professional development training. So when they're off, when there's no students in the building, we do have professional development with our staff. Uh, we just implemented a program classes for career advancements where they do get CEU credits. If they wanna advance and become cooks or managers, they learn the tools needed to be successful at it. Um, as Mallory stated, um, contests, we're having contests like such as best line setup, costume for Halloween and perfect attendance. Um, we have a menu committee. Um, Chef has cooking trainings for new menu items. He brings the staff down and he does demo trainings just to show them the serving sizes of that, how to best serve that product. Uh, retirement celebrations, we want our staff to feel valued and appreciated. And all our cooks and managers must have serve safe certification. So we do train them to and help them pass the test. As you can see on the pictures, um, top left, this was one of the contests that we had at a school. And the bottom is a Christmas um, best line set up for Christmas contest. Also, you will see pictures of the retirement. We gave our staff mugs and gifts, uh, gift cards. Um, far right, uh, when a staff, when a cafeteria staff completes some team building exercises, we do give them a certificate and it's um, signed by our um, director Hobbs, just to let them know, hey, we see you, we appreciate you, and we value you. So Robin also previously mentioned that we started doing some training classes for um, a career advancement. So the study kitchen is um, a new kind of university or class list that we've launched for our staff. So we can kind of separate them by, if you wanna be promoted to an assistant manager, here's a course you can take. If you wanna be promoted to a cook, here's a course to take, and then general classes. So they get released out and sent out through um, a, a, an email, and then the, the staff can decide if they, what classes they wanna take, which one would be best for them. And then we log it. They take a little assessment after, and we log it to remember for the next time they come in for an interview to say, oh, I was trained on this, I took this class. So you doing these things for our employees kind of sets the tone for the rest of the school. When you have happy employees, employees that feel like they're trained, employees that have a good morale, I think it brings in the scholars to the cafeteria because it's a warm, welcoming place. So as part of our evaluation for this program, there's two ways that we plan to evaluate. So the first one is using our Newton and Edison system, which is our point of sale system and our menu management system. And on here, we can look at our average daily participation for any given day, what menu items were actually quote unquote sold and what didn't, and then kind of looking at leftovers. 
The other thing that we plan to do is send out a survey to scholars and post it also on social media for the community and for other you know, staff members or whoever that wants to participate to just see what do they like that we're doing and what do they not like to figure out the actual feedback from the kids because they are our customers. So as I mentioned before, Newton is a tool that we plan to use for our evaluation. So this specific school is um, actual data from Adelaide Stevenson, which is a school on the east side of our district. As you can see over here, it has the date and the number of breakfast and lunch that was served. And, and you can see that it kind of fluctuates. So if we did an event, let's say on um, 11, 15, 2022, we'd be able to tell if that number was higher than what the other days served to see if that event actually did promote meal service. So this is one way that we can collect data on to see did our did our did our plan work did it not and kind of just see how how the day the, the week and the days grow. Edison is another way that we are able to collect data. So this is where our staff orders and puts in their production records. They have to um, type in the amount of each product that they serve that day. So as you can see, this is also I believe Adelaide Stevenson, and uh, it shows the snack and waffles that they serve that day. And it shows exactly how many waffles they served. And you can click on each item. So this is a way for us to tell, okay, so the kids like the waffles, but maybe not so much the broccoli cuts or not so much the turkey sausage patty, or maybe they did. It's just a more specific way to look at each school and see which items are selling and which items are not. And then, we also plan to do our survey. So once we do an activity in the school, we wanna release a survey to the kids and say, did you like this activity? Why did you like it? And what other activities or promotions would you like to see in the future? Um, just getting that feedback from the kids, like directly from the source, they are the ones that we are serving. So we want to know their feedback and we wanna know what's working and what doesn't work because at the end of the day, that's what we're here for. So, this includes, um, concludes our presentation. Does anyone have any thoughts on how we can increase participation? We're open to suggestions. Yes, we are open to suggestions. Thank you. Well, I think that's a fantastic project. I mean, nice job, Mallory, and fantastic. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, like, we visited the East Coast. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm getting like feedback on my side. We visited the East Professional. You know, you all hosted a co-ed out there and you did a wonderful job. But the food, I want to say like everything you had on display there and, and it was very professional and looked very appetizing. So I just wanted to give you a moment there because it definitely uh, fantastic. And um, I'm just curious to see like, you know, how things are received um, from the students. And do you ever like I guess the question is do you ever get feedback from the administration or teachers or professionals that are there do they have a yeah oh, yes. Robin's actually our customer service uh rep so she gets all that feedback yes <laughs> you know do they have tough ideas or you know give them a chance on come up with some yes and that's the that's the point of having principal meetings um, quarterly and getting the feedback from the principals because they are part of our support also. Um, if they're, I, I get a lot of emails saying, hey, how can we service, uh, better serve our tardy kids? So we do have those grab and go carts that you saw on the slide. They are on wheels. Our staff can roll them up to the entrance. And as kids, late, late kids are coming through the building, they can serve them where they can walk, get to class, but they, they'll have something to eat. Because again, a hungry child cannot learn. We want all our kids to eat. I had one more question before I'm gonna pass it to one over to Alexandra. And that is, do you ever have like to-go bags, like at the end of the day, not just like at breakfast or lunchtime, but do you ever at the end of the day as they're leaving? Yeah. Then, well, um, the Food Bank and Children's Hunger Alliance do weekend meals. A couple of our schools um, do Children's Hunger Alliance, and then some do um, the Food Bank, and they will get like big boxes of food home for the weekend. And then a lot of schools, too, we do an after school snack for if they have programming. And then some, the Children's Hunger Alliance and Food Bank can do after school meals as well. So there's a kind of partnership with um, outside organizations for all of that. 
Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, great job. And I really like the evaluation piece too. It was nice that you threw there at the end. I'm like, that's one of the big things as far as how you're going to attract the success of this. So great job. Uh, Alexandra, there, I'm just going to pass it over to you for any other feedback. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, fantastic presentation. Um, it was really great. I also really enjoyed the visuals. So um, you all did a great job. We do have a couple questions from some of our audience members. So our first question comes from your classmate, Chanel. So Chanel wants to know, what is ADP? Oh, average daily participation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes awesome. you go so you. into your own acronyms, you forget. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So we have a few more questions in the chat. Our next question comes from Director Stephanie Hobbs who is also um, one of our graduates of the Ohio Certified Public Manager Program. Um, so Director Hobbs says, you mentioned CEP or Community Eligibility Program. Um, what is the benefit of being part of a CEP? So the benefit of CEP, and I guess we forgot to mention this too, mm -hmm. because it's just part of our job. Um, all the kids at Cleveland eat free, mm -hmm. free breakfast, lunch, and after school snack if they're part of a program. Excellent, thank you. Uh, your coworker and fellow classmate, Mark, asks, what role does the federal government play in school nutrition? Uh, we report to, sorry, you can answer some of these too. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep telling <laughs> We technically like our boss is the Ohio Department of Education and then their boss is the United States Department of Agriculture. So I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yes. And uh, we have to because our department is federally funded. So we have to follow the rules and regulations of the USDA, which is our offer versus serve motto. We have to have certain signage um, in our cafeteria. Um, in the case we're audit, meaning we have to offer five components a day and the kids must on the on each kid plate must be a fruit or vegetable and in order for us to get credit for that meal. So each kid that go through the line that we put in our system, we get funding for it. So for us, bringing up meal, uh, increasing our meal participation is very important to yeah. our, to our um, department. There's a lot of rules that we have mm -hmm. to follow that nobody knows about, so. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So we do have um, a couple more questions. A lot of them are coming in the chat. So I'll try to go through these quickly. Um, Mayor Gallagher asked if you're doing anything about the recruitment issue. Actually, we don't have a whole lot of recruiting um, problems. We actually have a lot of staff. It's getting them to be at work is our biggest issue, mm -hmm. which is where the staff engagement comes in. Um, we at the beginning in the middle of the pandemic we did in our staff we have a staffing coordinator who does all the recruitment and job fairs and things like that but that's really not our issue our issue is encouraging the staff that we have to come to work and be positive great thank you um all right so it looks like we have a comment from uh Chief Dotson. So Lamont Dotson is another uh, Ohio certified public manager graduate, and he is on our advisory board and is also in the audience today. So thank you for attending. And he says, a uh, great presentation. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and then, okay, so we have two more questions so far. Um, and we do have a few more minutes. So for those of you in the audience, if you do have any additional questions, feel free to throw those either in the designated Q&A box or in the chat. Um, so Director Hobbs also asks, are there any takeaways from the Mentor or North Royalton programs you will be able to implement to Cleveland? Yes, well, for, for me, it was the level of teamwork and just talking to the staff, we were asking, how are they getting along? And we noticed that they're short staff also but just the level of teamwork, how do we bring that here? So these are things that we're brainstorming continuously and we're working on with our staff and we're trying to do incentives. Mallory has been ordering nice promotional items. Just She just um, made some aprons for our staff. So we're doing a lot of fun stuff with them. 
just to bring the morale up to build more good teamwork. We're trying to put good employees together that will work together because everybody can't work together. So we're trying to move staff around a little bit, if you know, and just put them together that for, so they can succeed. And the salad bar at Mentor and their gardens, um, Mallory just got us a grant for uh, fruit and vegetable um, bars and we can't wait to get that roll and to see how that goes yeah and she could talk and about we'll that. have to steal some of north royalton's recipes because yes. they had a lot of good, <laughs> different stuff going on there that they did okay i'll say borrow not steal. <laughs> <laughs> i think that's the nice thing in school nutrition is we're not really in competition with each other because we're all our own district so mm -hmm. like sharing ideas and making everything you know not the same but it, it's just we're not like restaurants where we're competing with each other. Makes sense. Yeah, thank you. So our last question comes from Tom Ragus, and he wants to know for the student surveys, do you have a goal in the number of responses to receive to make sure you have a confidence in the results? Um, we didn't think about that. So thank you, Tom. But yeah, we probably will want to set something like that. I know some days I'm just like, I'll take whatever I can get. <laughs> but um, no, I think that would be a good idea to add to make sure that we get a certain amount of responses so that we can actually have a good um, amount of feedback to compare with. All right, so I'm going to hold some space to see if we have any additional questions or comments in the chat or the Q&A box. Going once, going twice. All right, Rob, back to you. Well, fantastic again. I just want to, I do want to give a quick shout out to Director Hobbs and to Chief Dotson. I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody. They, they've been uh, champions for us for a long time, not only participants, but continue to send great people like Mallory and Rob and, and, and all the safety security folks. So a quick shout out to Chief Dodson and Director Hobbs. Uh, miss you all. I'm sure you don't miss me. It was, you know, it gets annoying and overwhelming. But anyway, um, nice. thank you for your support today. And uh, Mallory and Robin are fantastic. And um, I do want to uh, follow up on coming back out and having some more reunions or other project act or program activities and cohort functions at your place. So, um, and if that food, my, my stupid food truck idea ever gets uh, accepted, which I know it won't, but uh, I definitely want to bring the Magnus, you know, the I Magnus. I was going to say, we just want you to come with that anyways, regardless yeah. of if a food truck ever happens. I'm going to ask, yes. I, I don't know, I'll probably, I got, you know, I haven't got approval yet because they really don't want me to you know, embarrass the university any more than I already do. But uh, but I will try to, I'll try to steal it or kidnap that guy or whatever, whoever, whoever the Magnus dude is and we'll make that happen. Okay, sounds good. All right, great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, we are again off to another great start here with our project presentations. Uh, we have two more today and we're in the process of promoting Carl Kirkland up to the uh, presenter mode right now and um i was going to say from yesterday two of our biggest stakeholders have been cmsd and the rta on the local side of things and so today is a combo of cmsd and rta uh carl kirkland and then we're gonna follow up after carl with uh jeff grubb here right after him thank you for that thing good morning everyone I'm, I'm Carl Kirkland, the Director of Business Development here at the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. Our project, my project overview will consist of plan highlights, contract compliance, the scope of work, our project description, disadvantaged business enterprise, which is we call the DBE, Vendor Database, Master Database, DBE Contract Compliance Data, project deliverables, and then we're going to provide a solution and then a final goal. The plan highlights, it's a robust, uh, flexible diversity management system. There are five key areas that in my area of business development that I actually look for and design to um, tailor towards my needs. And this consists of vendor management and vendor management consisting of 
the um, prime contractors being able to uh, participate and input the data into the system, the contract compliance, where we will monitor the data that's pulled out of our Oracle system and making sure that um, payments are being communicated um, via our, our, um, our accounts payable department and, and making sure that the prime gets paid on time, but also making sure that our subs get paid on time through our contract compliance. Our certification management will consist of making sure that annual data that the prime contractor input into the system is current, um, where, where their, their financials, their um, um, information, you know, pertaining to their company, if there's a company change within ownership, this is where the certification management will take place. And then we have the labor compliance. The labor compliance will go into the minority work for utilization and then reporting. The reporting is where we will utilize it, where we report into our Federal Transit Administration. And then we'll customize this portal for our internal staff and our vendor access. And then we'll provide some training and technical knowledge transfer. And this is give you know, our prime contractors who are not familiar with the compliance system, um, uh, familiarity of the system and also GCRTA's ways and making sure that they are understanding our, our needs and our ways and how we do things here at GCRTA. Contract compliance. Most people does not understand what really contract compliance is. The standard. Contract compliance holds your operation to internal, internal and external standards. And it, it includes goal setting. The goal setting is where we set minority goals on procurement 25,000 and above. We have the KPIs, the key performance indicators, and then we have the audit, and the audit primarily keeps us on track of um, FTA guidelines and regulations. The scope of work. My goal is to make sure that it's a user-friendly system where our external, which is our prime contractors, and our internal, which is our, in, our internal engineering department, and also our IT and our procurement departments um, are, are able to utilize the system effectively within their own area. Make sure it's cost effective. We, when, when we're looking at cost effective, we're looking at um, how it's actually built and tailored towards your department's specific needs. They're capable of providing consolidated reports, the system will consist will assist me in providing um, my my triannual reports that I need that I submit to the Federal Transit Administration. It gives us right now we're on a we're 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 doing it manually, but right now what we're trying to do is is utilizing this system so we could have a more as um, an honor system where where it, this compliance system will keep our prime contractors and our engineering department honest when they're inputting data into the system for reporting purposes. Capable of providing extensive and import export functions. This system will assist us in that area of um, just making sure that it provides an extensive import and export function where, where the, the prime contractor cannot um, they, they're, they're not able to change the contract information. As we put the contract information to the system, the, the prime contract, we will list subcontractors that's going to participate. Some prime contractors will uh, try to change that information, and this system will keep them honest. Where they're unable to change the system, we will receive an alert that, the, that subcontractors are being changed um, via the system, we will see an alert, but the contract itself that they signed may have 
different verbiage. So we want to make sure that when this information is input into the diversity management system, it keeps it holds everyone accountable. And then there's the budget under information technology. In, IT actually pays the annual licensors that um, we get billed for the system, you know, for anything that takes place. And then you have to go through the RFE process. And it's working with procurement and making sure that it's fair and it's um, put out into the community where there's a fair share for everyone to participate in the procurement. Project description. The house, this is what house the DB vendor data and compliance information. It will hold all of the information that our subcontractors, which is our dispatch business enterprise vendors, all of their, their information, their, their annual financials, it will hold their ownership information. Um, this, key, this, this system is so robust where it just holds everyone accountable. And there's authorized internal GCRT users and authorized internal parties to enter main, maintain data within the database. This is where engineering department can, we can, as the administrator of this system, we could allow our engineering department input only information that's required to their area and then pull information out, such as uh, when it comes to queries pertaining to the um, locale of the workers. You want to be able to identify locale, the location of where workers live, because prime contractors can, this is where a lot of fraud will take place. Prime contractors, if they're working in Cahawka County, Prime contractors will pay if they live in if the uh, subcontractors living in I'll say Lorraine County, Cuyahoga County wage rates are higher. So prime contractors will try to pay them according to where they're they're living, and um, that is not that is not how it's supposed to take place. So this system will actually flag that and make sure that the information is um, sent to my office for review and then we will get a, an automated letter out to that prime contractor and and uh, make sure that they are paying them according to Calhoga, Calhoga County wage rates. The web-based ability for the general public and prospective DB businesses to access DB program certification and recertification information. This information is, the questions we always receive from prime contractors is, do you have a copy of our certification? This information will house that information for them, where they're easily able to access that information, where they don't have to consistently contact my certification specialist for this information, even if they're participating in um, uh, interstate certification when they want to do business outside the state of Ohio. The DB Vendor Master Database. This will house the general information, business ownership and categorization of their business, and that goes into, again, their financial, it goes into the ownership, and then there's required forms that's necessary that they have to complete to make sure that they're eligible to continue within the program. And then there's vendor communication. And the vendor communication consists of letters that we actually write and house. You know, um, if, if there is a prime contractor that um, submitting information into the system and it's wrong, an automated letter will actually go out to that prime contractor, giving them detailed information of how to complete it and correct the information that's in the system. So this, implement, this, this system actually keeps them honest, or try to. The DB contract compliance data, the prime contractor information, again, the project, project contract information, when a contract is actually input into the system, the prime contractor cannot change the information. Internal forces cannot change the information unless my office give authorization to do such as an administrator. 
the subcontractor, prime contractor related to information. The, the subcontractor have access to this information where the prime contractor sometimes, and this, this is where prime contractors try to hold, withhold information within a contract to a subcontractor and by them having access to the system, they have the, they're able to review the same information that the prime contractor will see on the contract that's signed through our legal department. It also gives them access to uh, payment details. When payments have gone out to the prime contractor, according to the Code of Federal Regulation, prime contractors are to pay their subcontractors within a two-week window of them receiving payment from GCRTA. This gives subcontractors access to the system so they're able to see when prime contractors receive payment. And then there's the project workforce information. This is the work for utilization where prime contractors, if they're again paying their subcontractors out of the, the county that they're working in, which is in this case would be Cuyahoga County, this gives them information within some where they can access it. The project deliverables, we're going to host vendor management, certification, contract compliance, and labor compliance system with access for all authorized staff and vendors for term of the contract. So everyone will have, for the, from the beginning to the end of this contract, everyone will have prime contractor, engineering, procurement, IT will have um, access to, to view documentation that's within that contract. The project management necessary to successfully complete the project. We want to contract technical and um, customer support. We want to make sure that the IT team from the system standpoint is communicating effectively with our IT team um, and making sure that, that when information is coming through our Oracle system, it's being transposed. So everyone will, will get the same data at the same time, and we want to make sure that everything is communicated effectively. And then there's the configuration and setup of the system where it takes time regarding you want to make sure that when we're building the system within my own area, it's configured um, effectively and working with our IT team. We want to make sure the IT team is able to access the information that's being um, sent via via the system via Oracle. And that's where the Oracle interface and contract and payment data will take place. And then we have the migration of existing active compliance and certification data, the training services for staff and vendors. We just want to make sure that everyone is uh, up on current information and, and not just information, but the current laws and making sure that they are understanding what the Code of Federal Regulations stand for because it can, it can jeopardize our funding because we receive federal funding. The user's manual for administrator and contract users, we want to provide a, a, a manual, uh, which in the process, I'm in the process now of creating a manual for the administrator and the contractor users so they could be able to, um, from the beginning to the end, understand each deliverable within that contract and, and, and how to input that information to the system. And then we're going to provide the support and training documentation that will go in hand with the training manual. Then we want to make sure that the standard reports are defined and selected by GCRT during the implementation phase. The solution. The diversity management system will provide the baseline system for staffing, staff management, contract, and vendor data. It will meet all function requirements defined in the RFP, the request for proposal. It will implement a proven system eliminates risk involved with customer development. There's no hardware or software to procure and maintain and then there's a proven integration experience with Oracle. Our goal is to provide a coherent single source work file for compliance and certification data. When FTA comes in to do an audit, we want to make sure that this system 
provides them accurate information instead of the manual process. So what we try to do is make sure we still do the manual, but we match the manual with the um, um, online data and make sure it's accurate information. So when FTA comes in, they'll have an accurate report on compliance in our certification data. Then it reduced the burden of data entry on employees, eliminated paperwork, repetitive data entry, it significantly reduced the cost of future disparity studies through um, accurate and comprehensive data collection. The goal is to increase the participation of contractors and encourage ownership of data. We want prime contractors to participate within the system, and most of them do, but we want to make sure that they uh, are utilizing the system because the city of Cleveland, the Northeast Ohio Sewer District are utilizing the same system, and we want to make sure that they, that GCRTA vendor database customers are do utilize the system as well. And then we emphasize vendor responsibility and accountability. In conclusion, this platform will provide GCRTA a system that streamlines current processes while providing a sound technology foundation for future evolution. At this time, I entertain any questions. Thanks, Carl. Sorry we had a little glitch there at the beginning, but you're starting to rock and roll. So um, thank you, very good. Um, where does this right now, I know that we talked about you are still in like the development, is this fully operational at this point in time? And, and are you evaluating or what is the status of the implementation of this program? Right, right now. Right now, right now, what I've done was I um, completed the fact-finding process. We're going to go through the RFP process, making sure that um, the the because uh, we're we're singling it as a sole source. What we try to do is make sure that if the single is a sole source, we make sure making sure that it's it's um, it's user friendly and where we are able to use the same um, our system for the Northeast Ohio Sewer District and the city of Cleveland can communicate with each other. So we're able to log into the system and we're able to communicate and use the same vendor database. So there's no overlapping there. That's great. That's great. Um, I guess um, on the reporting side, is there going to be some, um, as far as deliverables, you know, uh, understanding once this thing is fully implemented, how you and your team or different departments can use this information to monitor compliance and or deal with any issues as they pop up? Like, how do you foresee that unfolding? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Well, I'll start with my area. My area, because, because we receive federal funding, we want to make sure that the information uh, from the that the prime contractor signs when it once they sign that contract that con we manually input that contract into the system. Um, our engineering department will utilize the system for um, um, my well work for utilization portion. Make where where the locale of where they where their um, the workers are living. They pull that information according to geographical, and and our engineering, our senior director of um, engineering, when it when they go and lobby for funding, this information is being communicated to FTA, and it helps out with lobbying for additional funding. What we need regarding our trains, buses, or even our construction projects. And then one of my last questions, um, if you are, so you're working on monitoring the compliance with your contractors, if you find some organization that is out of compliance, I mean, what is the process then as far as to, you know, fix that or, or work with them? What, what's the next steps on how that works? Okay, the, ne the next step is first, what we try to do, uh, we, we walk them through the process because um, we're, we're the last Party, I would say, of utilizing this system um, and, and trying to make sure that it will fit the GCRTA. So making sure that uh, prime contracts are compliant 
Um, this, this system actually, it, it don't eliminate, but it kind of minimizes fraud within the prime contractor's um, information when they're inputting this information. Um, and that's also with other areas. It will eliminate fraud. And it also will just to the point where we our funding is not jeopardized through FTA. Okay. Well, I'll keep you up. And so I'm going to uh, pass the baton over to Alexandra for any kind of comments or further questions. So over to you, Alexandra. Yeah, thanks so much, Rob, and great job, Carl. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. So our first question comes from Chanel. Chanel wants to know, once the compliance system and procedures are implemented, will there be an effort to offer incentives for Cuyahoga contractors? Well, we get the answer is yes. What we try to do, and it's not just Cuyahoga County, it's the entire state of Ohio, um, prime contractor and subcontractors. My main function is to be an advocate for our subcontractors um, to make sure that there's contracting, um, contracting availability is um, available here at GCRTA. So within this system, this system will help me um, pull you know, that information. I'll use construction project on excavation. Excavation is, is um, digging. This system will help me identify every contractor that could participate in excavation in that area. And I'm able to pull the uh, a certified listing and provide prime contracts that information, not only just for Cuyahoga County, but just for the entire state of Ohio. Because we can't just single out just for Cuyahoga County because work is being done throughout. Great, thank you so much. Just a friendly reminder to our, our audience members, we do have a couple minutes for audience questions. So if you do have any questions or comments for Carl, please either chat them in the designated chat box, or you can also put them in the Q&A box as well, and we will definitely get to those questions or comments. So we do have two more questions so far in the chat. Uh, Robinette wants to know if this is a guaranteed improvement. Yes, it's a major, major um, improvement because right now we have been, um, we pretty much, it has been a, a manual process and the manual process will consist of getting, receiving documentation from our engineering department, then from the engineering process, just to streamline and fast forward a little bit, we, we get it within our area for, of uh, procurement. Procurement will vet, vet out that information to the community, and then we, as OB, as an off the business development, we take that information and from a compliance standpoint to make sure that the prime contract is compliant within that area. So it's a manual process, and this will help us primarily where it's not cutting someone's job, it's just making my compliance administrator, because I only have one compliance administrator, it will help him out where he could be more in the field. And, and what I mean by being in the field is making sure that prime contractors are compliant within the contract that they sign, within the work that they, the scope of work that they say that they were going to perform for GCRTA. Thank you so much. Mayor Gallagher wants to know how much process time does this save for RTA employees? I'll tell you, it can take it. it the, the process time it takes eight hours. It, it it can actually save us a day because um, or more because right now it takes us about. 72, 48 to 72 hours to uh, manually input this information to the system. Now, mind you, we have to wait to get the information from various departments. And if they have access to the system, they can just put the information into the system and we can receive that information, I would say, within 
an hour or two. It just really helped out my compliance administrator in that area to make his job more efficient. Excellent, thank you. We have two more questions so far in the chat. Courtney wants to know, what was your most interesting finding while researching your project? <laughs> the most interesting finding is fraud. It was, it was fraud. Um, when we started this, as I started fact-finding, um, and, and when I say fact-finding, I communicated and met with the city of Cleveland. I communicated and met with the Northeast Ohio Sewer District. And um, that was the biggest, um, that was the major piece that came out of was, was fraud from prime contractors. And I'll give another example. We put during the fact-finding process, we put a contract into the system. We told a prime contractor that he cannot, they cannot use certain subcontractors because they were not certified within our disadvantaged business enterprise program. They went and they put that prime contractor in the system anyway and tried to push it through as if we wouldn't receive alerts. So that's where the fraud come into play because that that actually that subcontractor was a front company where they would try to um, push it push the company through and utilize mm -hmm. them and get the project underway and so the system actually flagged. So fraud is the major component. All right, and our last question comes from Tom Ragus. Tom asks, what kind of support do you have from other departments that are involved in this? And will you be reporting the outcomes of this to the organization? Question is, the other departments are, are um, eager to participate within this. Procurement, it helps procurement within the Oracle system, it helps engineering with legislative when they go in and lobby for additional funding. And um, and the and the outcomes will will keep us in compliant, meaning GTRTA in compliant, and everyone working together. It's so so this this system is not just a, a department. This is a organizational piece. And during a fact finding, we wanted to make sure that everyone was able to utilize it. So now IT is is investing more with building modules within their areas where the system can assist them also, which is good because they are the ones who are actually going to be paying for the the licensors, you know, every year on this. So they want to be able to understand and know how it's going to be, how they're able to utilize the system as well. So it was a way, it was, in the beginning, there was some pushback because it was new. But now that there has been a lot of fact finding Data have been pulled. There's multiple communication that has taken place, um, and multiple questions that have has been um, asked. So, every department is ready to utilize the system now. All right. So those are all of our questions and comments for today. Thank you so much, Carl and Rob. Back to you. Thanks, Alexandra. Well, thanks again, Carl. Great presentation. I appreciate you being a trooper through those some of those technical issues, but as always, true professional and just knocked down the park. So, and I just want to say thank you for all your contributions throughout the lifespan of the session. You're always uh, one of our active participants that we're always can, you know contributing and adding value. So I just want to say thank you for that too. So um, good luck on the written report and um, appreciate you everything that you brought today. And I look forward to hearing continued success as you get this pro program up and running. So thank you very much. Thank you all so much. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton over to Jeff. So uh, Jeff, whenever you're ready, if you could just unmute yourself and um, pull up your presentation. My name is Jeff Grubb. I'm the Assistant Equipment Manager 
of fleet management at RTA. Um, I've been working for RTA for about uh, 16 years now. Uh, five years ago, I ventured into a uh, management team. This is, I was an assistant equipment manager of one of the districts. Uh, in February, Mar sorry, March of this year, I took over the department that I'm running now. And the, the department is the rebuild and replacement department. Uh, in these departments, we do all of the major uh, overhauls of engines, transmissions. Uh, anytime anything happens with the drivetrain of a bus, it comes to us. Uh, we take it out, rebuild it, um, replace it. We do everything we have to just to get the bus running again. Uh, we also have the rebuild department, which rebuilds all of our components. Everything from down from a starter to a blower motor, uh, shocks, to, not, sorry, not shocks, but uh, radius rods. We rebuild pretty much everything we can put into a bus that, you know, if we can build uh, and make it cheaper. Um, as I took over this spot, I a position, I went through the departments and just kind of looked at each one because there's different departments, you know, electrical department and a transmission department, engine department. Uh, I came across reclaim department. Uh, reclaim is a department that it brings in all the old parts. So as we replace certain components on the bus, there is an indication in our computer program that we have to send it back to the, the store, which we are the store. Uh, it comes back to us and then it's routed from there to a rebuild department. Um, it could be sent back out to a manufacturer to have them rebuild if it's cheaper for them to do it. Sometimes we just bring uh, parts back so that we can uh, use their metals for core charges. We you know recycle the steel or the aluminum. Um, so I really wanted to look at this department because of the amount of stuff. I'm just going to use stuff. There is stuff everywhere in this department. Um, there was boxes everywhere. Um, the, the program that we used to use was called fix it failure. So whenever something broke, we would bring the bus in and fix it. So the problem with fix it failure is, is there's a customer uh, nuisance. Well, the bus can break down. Now we got customers stranded on the road. We have to send a mechanic out to fix the bus, or we got to send out another bus with another bus driver to pick up the, the bus driver or the passengers that are stranded. And this is, you know, largely most industries run this way and they've run this way for years because that's just what the normal was. Um, at some point in time, we decided to uh, go into a program called predictive maintenance. Uh, predictive maintenance is a system that's set up that you use manufacturer re recommendations and you use a data from telemetrics to find out parts that fail, um, find out when parts fail and say something lasts, you know, two and a half years, you know, they're known to fail after two and a half years. Well, at that one and a half year point or the two year point, you bring the bus in before it breaks down and you replace all these parts. Um, the, the main part of the predictive maintenance is it helps prevent breakdowns. Uh, it actually helps supply chain budget their, um, supply chain is our parts department. They uh, um, can budget their uh, purchasing of parts better because they know we're gonna replace all of these parts on all of these buses every year. We're not all of a sudden having them all break at the same time. Um, this also helps us lower the end of uh, life cost of maintenance of coaches because if you replace the parts on a fix it failure cycle, basically when the buses are 10, 12, 13 years old, um, that's when they break down the most. The parts are old, the, you know, everything's beat up. So that, that's when we put a lot of our labor and a lot of our parts in our oldest buses and then we get rid of them. Um, it kind of makes no sense when you really think about it. So why not start putting the parts and the labor in early on and it kind of levels out that line so that uh, we're, we're spending a known amount every year on the buses and then end of life cost isn't like a shock to us right as we send it to a junkyard or sell it to another transit agency or wherever they may go from that point um the problem with this new predictive maintenance program was the amount of parts that came in all of a sudden that we weren't, we never saw before, like, oh, okay, we'd have starters here and there, you know, this, that, and the other, we'd have five starters this month, and we'd have two starters the next month, all of a sudden, we're getting eight starters, and we're getting eight water pumps, and we're getting eight of, you know, just everything you could think of that was, we were replacing was all coming back to this department, um, 
this program started on some of our newer coaches. So the older coaches were kind of left to, you know, as a fix it failure, the newer coaches started in this predictive maintenance program. So as we started getting this influx of parts, it really inundated this department. Um, and the old parts that they should have gotten rid of kind of got pushed into the back corner and kept getting pushed further and further back. And next, you know, they, they were forgotten about there. They just sit back there. Um, so they became confused. The department was confused because usually they get a part that's broken. Sometimes these parts look new. Sometimes they could see very little wear on them and they, what are we supposed to do with them? You know, um, it, it, it Nobody really sat down and was ready for this part of the program. We, we were ready for the maintenance, uh, ready for the, you know, replacing the parts. We had the mechanics ready. We didn't have the reclaim department ready. Um, so as I took over to the department, I had to figure out really how the department worked. Um, I tried doing different analysis and I, I, I kind of got lost in the analysis because I couldn't figure out what I was doing. Um, and then I had to step back and I had to realize I had to use the lean method. Um, this, I wasn't trying to start something new. I was just trying to rehab something that's been going. So uh, if anybody who's not familiar with the lean method, uh, going to Gemba. Gemba is a Japanese term used for uh, meaning to where the work is done. So you go to Gemba, you go to where the work is done. I watched the department work. I, I asked questions and, you know, I had all kinds of questions I had to ask. You know, I, I didn't know how that department worked really. It was just back in the corner and the parts just went where they went to. It was you no know, magic at first. Um, so I had to know who, who needed the parts. Uh, how were the parts moved? Who knows what parts are on the shelves? Uh, do we even know what parts are on the shelves? How many of these parts do we need? Uh, where do we go from here? We had a lot of stuff on these shelves when I took over. Um, one of the interesting things that I found out uh, during the process was that nobody could tell me everything that was on those shelves. Um, we have a computer program that as we replace a part, um, we know that there is a core. That's what, that's what these parts are called that are back in this department. The core is coming back to us. Now, you know, sometimes that, maybe that part was taken off the bus and it was completely broken, unrepairable, and the mechanic knew it, and they throw it out in the trash. So now our computer program says we're supposed to have seven of these parts. You go back into the reclaim department, we only have four. Or sometimes it'd be the other way around where you go back to the reclaim department, we have 10, 15 of these parts, but the computer says we're only supposed to have two. So there was a big disconnect. Um, so I had to kind of develop a plan um, to kind of tighten up all the confusion. So the plan was pretty easy. Just count, identify uh, count everything that was in that department and identify what they were and put them in a certain location so we know where they were at. Um, four major steps I came up with was clean, define, refine, and maintain. Um, I needed them to count and clean everything. So while you're counting, throw away some old garbage, you know, anything that's obviously not going to be used anymore, get rid of it. We got to figure out what we're going to do with some of the stuff that we can sell or maybe rebuild for another fleet of coaches. Um, we needed to identify who, who needed to have the reporting of what parts were on the uh, lift. So we had to define that process. Um, defining that process actually became pretty easy. Um, it, you'll see in my next slide. Um, I, I made a simple spreadsheet for the employees down there, down in the department. Count the number of parts, give me the part number, and a brief description. That was it. So they just started going along and doing that. And then, I kind of looked at that spreadsheet and it was a very simple Excel spreadsheet, no bells or whistles. And I was trying to make one add all bells and whistles and kind of went back to the simple plan because it was working. I just added more lines to this um, uh, spreadsheet. And I found that by adding more lines to the spreadsheet, I was able to put the location on it. I was able to put the part number on it, you know, what it was, how many it was there, how many parts we had. Um, and then I just added two more lines and I made this a live spreadsheet so that multiple departments can use this. So now the employee starts counting the um, parts. They enter the parts into the database, you know, the spreadsheet. Uh, another department, our reclaim department, monitors this and says, hey, we have, you know, the computer says we're supposed to have 10 of these modules and we have 20. What are we going to do with them? All right. So they just tell us how many they want to keep in on the shelf as rebuildable cores. And in the notes section, they said, okay, 
dispose of or send back for core or, you know, whatever we needed to do with it at that point. It's kind of funny because I had four major steps and a very simple spreadsheet fixed my three, my steps cleaning, because as they counted and they identified everything, they were cleaning everything up. Um, defining where the part was and where it had to go. Well, that all fell on this simple spreadsheet. Refining the process. Well, this is now the process. We, we count everything as it comes in. We hold it. We, you know, we'll, we'll rebuild some stuff as needed. So some parts don't make this list because they're larger components, the engines. Obviously, we're going to rebuild an engine. We don't hold them in that department for a long time. We take them and send them to another department. And as we rebuild these uh, components, um, but some of the smaller stuff, modules, you don't, the vendors don't want a, a, an engine module one at a time. Wait till you have 10 or so and send them to us so that we're not rebuilding one here. And then, you know, they, they want batching rather. Um, so this became a very easy to train on um, pro, uh, spreadsheet. Um, everybody picked up on it real quick. It had uh, the supply numbers were live. So on a daily basis, they can change this. I had real-time communication because I shared this as a uh, shared document between multiple departments, and it ended up uh, kind of just taking off. Um, but as it got easy, I was like, oh, man, this would be really easy. I ran into what most managers do, and this is my first project where I'm actually changing a process that's going to affect other departments. I've had minor changes here, but this one's kind of on a larger scale for me. I it's not the largest I've seen, but um, the buy-in. This is the first time I ran into all of a sudden, like all the employees are asking all these questions. You know, what, why am I doing this? We've never done this before. Or are you guys replacing us? You know, this, this, this is stupid. I mean, I, I'll, and it just kind of, I got inundated by it. Um, so I started slowing down and then working with individuals rather than saying, this is what we're doing. Everybody do it. I started working with individuals, kind of easing their pain explaining my goal, um, explaining why I wanted to do this, explaining why, you know, it was a safety ha uh, hazard. There was boxes everywhere. There's parts everywhere. There's aisles you couldn't walk down. So um, we needed to start moving forward. Um, had a few of them all of a sudden saying, hey, this is pretty easy. I'm just counting things and putting it on a shelf. I mean, what's so hard? I'm just going to do it and you do your part, you know? Okay, thank you. Um, we started moving forward and then it, it, it kind of caught me off guard because as I'm trying to figure out how to figure out to, to um, get the buy-in, the buy-in happened. I, 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 and I would love to say I did it, but I think they did it. I just kind of showed them the way. Um, right off the bat, the main aisle and the main area where all the parts come in, I walked over one day and I was like, where'd everything go? And they're like, oh, well, they showed me where it was at, looked at the spreadsheet and here it is here and here it is there. And we moved this here. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, thank you. So it, 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 it's working. Um, I didn't, I didn't even know they were cleaning this section up. I had, I had, um, I um, focused on another section, which I thought was a safety hazard, but they felt that they needed to clean this area up to move that area out to this area. So this is now the staging area. They take a whole bay and they just pile it up right here and then they sort it out where it's got to go and put it back where it's got to go. So they kind of develop their own process and I just, I keep became hands off of it. If it's working, I'm not going to fix it. Um, so uh, another main aisle, everything got cleared up real quick. Um, this is just, you know, not me telling them to do it. They just started taking that simple Excel spreadsheet and everything started to just kind of fall into place. Um, we've identified minimum quantity levels of certain these parts. So in this picture here, you got like in the, on the right side, you got these dark, they look, they look like uh, tables that are stacked up. Those are actually window frames, but window gets broken. We can take the frame, clean it up, put new uh, hinges in it, put a new window in it. The bus goes back, or sorry, the bus goes into a window. The window goes back into a new bus or another bus. Um, we didn't need... 150 of these we only needed 50 we you know why are we holding 150 i don't know nobody really knew we just threw them over there and that's where they sat so we went down to 50 of these windows this happens throughout a lot of the uh parts we were holding on to some of the parts were actually so outdated that the um the the uh buses were retired when i was a mechanic 10 15 years ago when i first started the buses were retired we've never even had these buses here we haven't had them here for 10 years but we still have parts for them back there so we had to start getting rid of all those um this project is still definitely in its infancy um 
right now, so I'm going to loop back to that predictive maintenance. My goal is with this program is to now, um, the parts that are coming back for predictive maintenance, we've never set up a uh, system to inspect these parts. So we should be taking these parts and inspecting them and saying, hey, you know what, we could probably go another year on these. Maybe we can you know, put a new bushing in and get two more years on them. We got to take these parts that are being re replaced before failure and can they last longer? Can we do something? Do we need to replace them even at all? Like maybe we're replacing a part that probably will never fail and we don't need to replace it. Um, we have to start kind of, this is the beginning of this data entry. So I'm going to have a crew, I'm, I'm building a crew right now that is in charge of taking the parts, taking the parts apart inspecting, uh, re recording, reporting whatever they find and, and giving me best recommendations. So I'm gonna take these recommendations and then we'll try to uh, change the predictive maintenance program. Maybe we don't replace this part every year, we replace it every other year. Maybe we don't replace this part every second year. Maybe we take it off and just put a bushing in it and send it, put, put it right back in. Um, the point of this is to reduce the waste of good parts to, um, minimize the labor used if we don't need to keep replacing this part why are we replacing it um it's it's going to have kind of a compounding I, I would love to tell you like a dollar figure what i think I, it could save but I, I i don't know um because it's compounding it's um we're going to be saving on parts we're going to be saving on labor and the labor is actually not just my department but multiple departments that touch these uh items we can i, I don't know where it ends with the uh cost savings with this um, I'm hoping by February to March, I'll have the team uh, built and we will start the data processing to figure out, you know, what, what parts can we prolong? What parts can we, uh, you know, not replace? Maybe we got to add more parts to it or instead of replacing this part, we can replace another part. It's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a great program. We just need to refine it. Um, and uh, I know it was kind of quick. I thought it would go a little longer than that. Sorry, but uh, is there any questions? You know, Jeff, I got to tell you, like, this is my dream project because you mentioned a couple of things there uh, the, about the Lean Six Sigma uh, concepts about the Gemba and uh, was other, the batching the, of the batching was another. That's a classic Lean Six Sigma. But my yeah. point is, um, this is, I think, what a classic process improvement project looks like for, for PMA. I, I'm not sure. I believe you work with Michelle Berry. Uh, yes. So Michelle came back, and I'm not going to call anybody. Like I'm using Michelle because she was one of the first folks in that area to kind of adopt and embrace and kind of engage in this concept. But Michelle was very frustrated with the fact that there was a lot of obsolete parts and that stuff was everywhere and that you had no idea what was going on. And so it was like, it was all those things you mentioned, safety issue, um, wasting of funds, or that there there's obsolete parts from buses that don't even exist anymore. Yeah. And the antiquated process that was being used to manage it was like, it was, that was obsolete, like that, that you could not function in there. And so like, I'm so excited to see that that is continuing on. And I think one of the, one of the outcomes or one of the things that I think that is fantastic in your project is how you mentioned about your team and your coworkers, like embracing it and then taking mm -hmm. it on and then them coming up with other ways to try to make it more efficient and effective. So I, I think that it's, you know, a picture sells a thousand words as far as what they came up with, as far as that staging area and how they organize things. Yeah. But, it is like lighting a match because it'll start to just take over and, you know, hopefully the folks in, in there will just embrace this kind of concept and continue to evolve and expand over time. So um, I just I hope that you can tell my enthusiasm, but I'm a geek for some of these Link Six Sigma stuff because it just works and it, it, does. It, it just does. And it's not, it's not rocket science in the, in the sense of, you know, but at the same point in time, it's just, it's so helpful. And I have no idea how you could know where good parts were, bad parts. I mean, if you just are, have junk or just stuff thrown everywhere, uh, how could you maintain a, a good shop? And one other thing that um, I remember from the last time, you know, we're talking to Michelle was when, when a, a, a bus or a paratransit, whatever, a vehicle would, would break down, 
you wouldn't even know if you had the parts there to fix it. And then if yeah. and then if your inventory showed that you had that, but you couldn't find it or it wasn't up to date or whatever, then all of a sudden, if there was a backlog of, oh, we have to order something. And then if the supply chain issues would occur, which we're dealing with now, sometimes that that unit would be offline for an you know, indefinite period of time. Yeah. So anyway, that's just, I'm, I know I'm rambling, but this is, <laughs> I'm so excited because this is exactly what I'd like to see. You know, and across. Michelle Berry is actually one, uh, I've worked closely with her on this project. She, her team is the one that's vetting and, and uh, making sure the, the count's right in the program that what we have on the shelf. And then they're, they're the ones that are telling us where they go, what, what's going on from here. So uh, it's been kind of a neat program. Like I said, this is my first one where I've actually done a big process change. So when the employees kind of took over and did it on their own, I was kind of, that was kind of neat to say, oh, look, I must've done something right because that they, they did it right. So it was yeah. kind of cool. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it take off up from me. Well, and I'll just have one more comment and then I'll pass the baton, but I think it's a combination of both the management, like the technical side of here, we have to fix this particular issue. Mm -hmm. But I think you're also tapping into some leadership skills there too, of like, okay, once the, your organization and your folks that you're working with start to embrace and adopt and, you know, execute these things, like the idea of get out of the way and let them take ownership yeah. and then put their fingerprints on it and kind of let them, you know, show you what's going on. And then what you have to do is just basically make sure you're supporting them, embracing them and, and, and congratulating them for going that extra mile and stuff like that. So anyway, yeah. uh, I'm going to stop because I can go on forever. Yeah. People have to see today. Alexandra, over to you. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Rob, and great presentation, Jeff. Um, we have a few questions and comments from some of your classmates. Mayor Gallagher uh, starts with a comment. So she states, the cost of parts have skyrocketed recently. It would be interesting to see the dollar amount of how much savings and reassessing um, how much inventory is actually necessary. And then we do have some questions as well. Um, so Mark asks, has the recent supply chain uh, crisis disrupted parts for RTA and how have you overcome this? Yeah, we have a huge issue right now with it. And I hate, you know, I use this smart part, dumb part idea. Um, a dumb part is, a, is a, a part that just does its job because it's designed to do its job and it's just, it's a mechanical feature. Then you add a computer to it to make it smart. Um, Computer chips is one of our, obviously everybody's having problems with computer chips and we have simple pumps that just pump coolant. That's all they do. They just pump coolant and there's a switch that turns them on and a switch that turns them off. It's a very simple system, but the newer buses decided to put a computer on this same pump. It's a very simple pump, but guess what? We can't get them. like, we cannot get this pump because the computer chips don't exist all of a sudden. So um, we've had to go and revert back of putting a simple switch and a pump in place of a smart pump that has a computer that tells it when to turn on and off. Um, we, we're, we're running into that a lot right now with uh, supply chain issues, even simple things as shocks. We've had buses that have been waiting for shocks for way too long, you know, weeks at a time waiting for a shock, but that's, that's the most recent one that came to my mind. Um, but yeah, it's it, the, the rebuild program does save us in this because we, maybe we can't find the shock, but or like say that pump, maybe the pump was just the bearing went bad or the impeller went bad. Well, we can buy the bearing, we can buy the impeller, replace that part. If computer chip goes bad, well, we're stuck. So it's a, we got to revert back to older ways and you know replace it with older and reprogram the bus sometimes. Thank you for that. We do have a comment and a question. Uh, Danielle Romanowski states, you cleaned things up, you're saving money, you're being more productive, and you're keeping an open mind for continuous improvement. Great job. Thank you. All right. Um, our last question so far, um, and we still have plenty of time, so if you're out in the audience, please send in any questions or comments you have for Jeff. Um, but our, our last question as of right now comes from Allison Urban. Allison states, in what ways have you seen daily productivity change since implementing this process? And what do you project for monthly or yearly productivity? 
So productivity, that department alone um, has one major, um, one main employee and a couple other employees that kind of assist. Um, in, in the cleanup process, all of a sudden, those two assisting employees don't even go over there anymore because it's so much cleaner. Everybody knows where everything is. It, that process is so much faster now and more, you know, refined it. It only needs the one person to drop that, that uh, down to one person, leaving us the ability to rebuild uh, more parts. Uh, the parts that are coming in, we were able to rebuild by using the other two employees. Um, month by month right now, the, the major thing I'm focusing on is the um, predictive maintenance. That is a program we started a couple of years back, maybe four years back now, maybe even longer than that. And it's, we've never started the process of inspecting and auditing the parts we're taking off. So I'm in the process of defining of how we're going to get all those parts back, have them labeled with part numbers. Um, like I said, I think it's March, March or April or, or February, or March. I want to get this department rolling to where we're actually inspecting these uh, uh, components and rebuilding them and starting to make changes to our predictive maintenance program. Um, a year from now, I, I don't know. I'm actually a little bit further than I thought I'd be at this point. Um, I, I don't have a, a focus on a year from now. I'm, my main focus is on from two to three months from now. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna hold some space for any additional questions that come through. But overall, we've been getting a lot of positive comments in the chat. I don't know if you saw those, Jeff. Um, overall, really great job, really smooth presentation. And we're excited to see to um, how this project will pan out as you move forward. Yeah, me too. It's a uh... It's kind of neat. Like I said, this is my first project that I've done where I'm making an actual process change. And uh, it's kind of neat to see it take off so fast. And it, it's the beginning of more because it's the, the entire, you know, rebuild department that I'm in, in, in charge of. It, it needs time. It's time for it to update its processes. So this is my, this is the beginning and then it's going to kind of flow from here. So. That's great. All right, Rob, um, it looks like we are done with questions, so I will pass it back to you. Again, a great job, Jeff, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Great job. I look forward to reading the paper. Uh, this is, you know, continue on with this excellence and let me know uh, on how things evolve over time. And uh, please uh, tell your team I said hello, too. So, uh, it's been fantastic. So this concludes our presentations for day two.